So um, thank you everyone for waiting. We'll we'll get started now. Um, so first of all, what I'd like to do um, is on behalf of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the many lands on which we meet. And we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Okay. And I will mute my telephone. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so first of all, I'll um, introduce myself. My name is Mark Cooper. I'm the deputy director of the ARC Center of Excellence for Plant Success. And I'm really excited to introduce Professora Daniela bustos Cortes from Universidad uh, Austral de Chile, who is going to speak to us today. Um, before I do that, what I'd just like to do is um, introduce or remind those that are already aware of it, of the Genotype by Environment by Management Interaction Symposium number three, G by E by M Symposium number three, um, that will be um, getting underway and in Wageningen, Netherlands, as a hybrid event online and in person um, on Wednesday the 30th and Thursday the 31st of October. And so we, within the Centre of Excellence, we initiated this. This is the third event. It's an annual event. The first was run in Brisbane in Australia in 2022. Um, the second at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and the US in 2023. And so the third iteration is with the partner institution Wageningen University in the Netherlands in later in October. And so the symposium provides a worldwide um, forum, a podium for presentations and discussions around modeling and prediction issues that relate to G by E by M interactions in agriculture and the features that this introduces to um, challenge us on the prediction side. For this meeting, online in attendance and participation is free, so you can register online. And if you want to attend in person, there's still spaces available. And on um, in, in person um, attendance would be 150 euros that can be paid through the Wageningen um, website. So on the screen, you'll see a link and a QR code uh, for the webpage, so you'll be able to um, um, get that information and register if you're actually interested. And if you um, enjoy the presentation today um, from Daniela, um, I think you'll enjoy the symposium. Daniela is one of the co-organizers of the symposium as a, an associate investigator of the Center of Excellence and has had a long-term involvement in this um, area of research. So now let's move on to welcome Daniela. And um, as mentioned earlier, Professora Daniela is based at the Universidad Austral de Chile. I'm sure she will introduce this much better than I can. So I'll leave that um, to Daniela. And her main interest is in genotype to gene to phenotype modeling to characterize and predict uh, crop adaptation across challenging and multiple environments and using modeling approaches to integrate physiology crop modeling and statistical methods. And she's currently leading a number of projects focused on wheat adaptation to dry environments. And as well as the research um, role at the university, also is teaching bachelor's, undergraduate degree students and postgraduate courses, focusing on models to support breeding and agronomic management decisions. So Daniela, thank you very much for um, joining us. Um, we will um, really appreciate the, the seminar you're about to give. Um, and for those that are listening, the procedure for asking questions is to enter those into the chat and um, I will um, manage the um, um, passing these um, messages, the, the questions on to Daniela at the end of the, the presentation. So thank you very much and over to you, Daniela. Thanks a lot, Mark. And uh... For the introduction, so I will uh, share my screen now. Um, yeah. Can you see my PowerPoint? Perfect, coming through right yeah. perfectly now. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thanks. 
Well, thanks a lot for the inv invitation. It's really a pleasure to talk to people that are in the future. So for you, it's already Friday. For me, it's still Thursday. <laughs> uh, so nice talking to you. Um, like um, Mark was saying, I moved to, uh, I will, sorry. I will. I'm currently based in uh, the south of Chile. So we have this very long country uh, in uh, South America and we are based in the south. So this is usually a very green part of, of the country. We are about uh, 850 kilometers to the south from Santiago and it's a university city. So not very large, but it has a very lively environment and the university has a really a central role in the in the development and in the city activities. So you can see we have a lot of connection with water because it's, uh, we are we have a big river. So actually the university campus is on on an island close to the sea. So it's a very nice place to come and visit. And it's also a very nice place to grow wheat. So this is why my research is connected to wheat adaptation. We have a very high yield potential uh, in the south of the country. So this is uh, why this is a very uh, relevant crop for us. So in more general terms, uh, we need to go back and uh, think about the goal of plant breeding. Plant breeding. So we want to produce these varieties that perform well in a target population of environments. So this TPE is known as the collection of soil and uh, weather and agronomic management conditions that varieties will encounter when they are planted later by farmers. So we try to represent this TPE with some trials that are basically structured as a number of locations, years, and could be also managed environment trials. So when we want to predict crop adaptations, more and more we are shifting towards these uh, prediction-based plant breeding programs. Why? Because they enable us to increase genetic gain. So basically the uh, gain in grain yield of the newer varieties compared to the uh, recent older, older uh, uh, varieties. And we can increase the genetic gain in multiple ways. On one hand, to increase the selection intensity, and this is why predictions also help us because we can enhance the number of genotypes that are evaluated in the selection process. Also by uh, increasing heritability, for example, by incorporating multiple traits or multiple environments or more precise phenotyping, or also like I will try to show in this talk to in incorporate information about trade dynamics. Another way of increasing uh, this uh, genetic gain is by in enhancing genetic, genetic variation. So nowadays there are more complex process or larger populations that can be considered in these prediction steps. And therefore it's also a way to uh, uh, facilitate or to increase the chances that at least a few of the genotypes will perform well in the target population of environments. On the other hand, the prediction technologies can also help us in uh, increasing the genetic gain by trying to predict earlier, for example, in the season or earlier in the breeding program, how they will perform when uh, the genotypes are evaluated in uh, full plots and multiple, multiple environments. So these three main ways are strategies to increase uh, genetic gain in our breeding program. Like, this is not moving. So this slide I took from a paper by, by Graham Hammer actually, that tells how actually we need to keep in mind always how the trials that we have in this multi-environment uh, network represents the TPE and the target population of genotypes and how these multi-environment trials help us predicting either how the genotypes that were observed are predicted in new environments, in another location, in another year, for example, or how for a given environment, other genotypes that were not evaluated would have performed, or the most difficult scenario, of course, is how we could predict the performance of new genotypes in new environments, new locations or years, for example. 
So when we want to do this exercise of predicting G by E by M, so predicting either new environments, new genotypes, or the combination of both, we need to first understand the structure of the TPE to understand the, whether we are having clear mega environments or clear scenarios like the drought scenarios like you have in Australia, for example. Also, whether there are certain trends in space or time. Are there specific gradients, for example, along latitude or longitude that could help us understand the structure of G by E? Or are there, for example, for example, specific years that uh, in which varieties per perform in a different way. And in the second part of my talk, I will refer more to the dynamic part of G by E. So how we can incorporate information about traits over time and how these traits can help us understanding the physiological mechanisms that underlie uh, crop adaptation. So for the first part, I will show one example uh, that is not related to stay green, as I indicated by my title, I apologize by that, but it's more related to how we can incorporate information about different traits to structure or to understand the structure of the GPE. And here there are many different strategies. Uh, uh, one, one that is widely used is the millennial mixed models, of course, but there could be one that I will show one example now that are self-organizing maps, for example, to, to, to incorporate the information from multiple traits. So what is a self-organizing map? Uh, probably you are more familiarized with uh, types of analysis like principal component analysis, for example, that try to model the relationships between traits. In a self-organizing map, we have a similar um, idea but it's a little simplified in the sense that we stretch the space in variation of variation in two dimensions. So basically we try to arrange data that is highly complex, that is multidimensional in a grid that is ordered. This is why they are also called a sort of ordination and classification methods, because we try to map these degrees of similarities or the degrees of correlation between variables in this two-dimensional grid. And in this two-dimensional grid, we have units that are called uh, basically these circles we have here, and we have prototypes. And prototypes are typical patterns we observe in trade relationships. For example, in this case, we have some observations or some locations in which, for example, we have a certain pattern in which we have a high grade number, but low values for the other traits. Or we have other uh, locations in which we have in genotypes tend to show, for example, high values for all variables. So in this way, we can order on one hand uh, the units by the degrees of similarities, but also have a sort of classification in which we say, okay, all the blue ones tend to behave in a one way and all the uh, orange ones tend to behave in another way. So actually these self-organizing maps also have some nice properties because they enable us to combine traits of different nature. Many times when we have trials, for example, we have variables that are quantitative, like for example, grain yield, continuous random variables, grain yield, biomass, date to flowering, etc. But we could also have things that like disease scores that are categorical. So if we have a, a self-organizing map, it, ha it has the nice property in which we have different layers. And each layer, can have also a different type of variable. So in this case, for example, we have here in the rows, we have each trial. Um, in the columns, we have different variables and each of these layers could be a layer of different uh, nature or different uh, type of variable. And at the end, we combine those layers to classify in these trials um, and see how genotypes would react uh, overall, an overall reaction for all traits across trials. So if we have a, this overall distance that is a weighted average of all the types of information we are including about the reactions of our genotypes. So here we need to go back a little bit and think about the definition of the TPE 
and how we represent this TPE by different trial. Because while this work we were uh, dealing with a large uh, data set for a sunflower um, adaptation in Europe uh, collected by Corteva, and we had a little, a little bit of the challenge that year to year, the trials were not made at the same location. They were nearby, they were in next farm, etc., but they were not exactly at the same spot. However, we said, well, actually they are not exactly at the same spot, but they aim to represent the same parts of the TPE. So one of the things we said, well, actually we tried to group trials, yes, looking at latitude and longitude, nothing else, and say, well, these trials we will um, use as the same sample of that part of the TPE. Here we have the south of France, then we have another trial a little bit further north, etc. So basically, this will be sort of the units we want to classify. Sub uh, or, or um, production regions of interest, let's say. And then we will look how these regions of interest behave and whether they are similar or whether they induce similarity in the reaction of the traits, uh, um, traits of the different genotypes. So actually then we said, well, actually, if, for example, a certain flowering time leads to high yield in a certain location, perhaps the same flowering time leads to lower yield in another location. So actually the relationships between these uh, uh, traits indicate the type of adaptation mechanism that was relevant to a particular environment. So here we have the data structured in one layer per genotype. And then we had uh, on the rows, we have the trials and on the columns, we have the different traits. In this case, we have yield, but we also had oil concentration and thermal time to flowering. So we have three different traits. And we have genotypes, for example, the genotype eight, that in certain environments, so here the different prototypes indicate groups of environments, of trials. Uh, in some of the environments, for example, they, they had high yield and high thermal time to flowering, but low oil content, for example. Whereas in others, the same genotype had a different profile. So in that way, we were able to classify trials, but here we are looking at year location combinations, not locations themselves, like the thing we want to uh, classify when we want to work with mega environment. So we had some year location combinations in which genotypes reacted in this way indicated by the yellow pattern, for example. And we had other year location combinations in which, for example, genotype 16 was very unlucky and had very low values for all traits, and genotype 8 at high values for particularly thermal time to flowering and uh, yield, for example. So then we looked and we went back and we said, well, if we have this certain pattern, how often a certain pattern occurs in a particular location? So we said, well, actually we can group locations based on how often a certain pattern occurs. So for example, here in the South, we have these two sets of uh, environment or the, in which very often across years, we had uh, the yellow pattern of response between genotypes. And towards the north of Europe, we had more often that the uh, blue pattern was occurring most often together with the gray pattern. So in this way, we used the frequency of this environment classification across years to classify location. In that way, we went for some, from something that was year dependent, so we have year to year variation, to something that is more year independent, because this is at the end what we want when uh, we are uh, classifying uh, locations uh, into regions. Yeah? So we went to, from something that has a year dependency and which we use the frequencies of those environment types to classify them and to go to a map that is more year independent. The question is then, well, if G genotype by location by year is large, how successful are we when we are incorporating uh, these types of uh, classification? Well, we were very optimistic at the end, uh, but yeah, 
this was mo the success was moderate and how we can uh, know that because basically the prediction accuracy so when we predict how new genotypes would have behaved in these environments the prediction accuracy was higher when we predicted specifically for each environment uh, for each um, uh, adaptation zone so for each region but it was not a lot larger than when we would have ignored these um, groups. So basically we gained in accuracy, for example, here we went from 0 0.42 to 0 0.48, 51. So we had a moderate uh, success. So this is one way of uh, understanding the structure of the TPE when we try to uh, get rid of this G by E by L and simplify it and to try to make recommendations that are specific to uh, groups of locations that are consistently uh, showing a certain pattern over years. The second part that I want to show now that are more is more related to the work that uh, is ongoing now in, in some projects that we are uh, that we have here in Chile is how we can model traits over time and how these traits over time can help us understanding the GBIE patterns. So here, well, before we go into some examples, I want to go back to a more general framework. Every time uh, we want to do additional phenotyping effort is very expensive, it's time consuming, it's a little bit uh, technically challenging. So we need to think, why do we want to do this? Well, actually, I think we should only do this if, if we can uh, increase the genetic gain by helping the prediction of our target trait. So I should only measure more things if they will help me predicting yield, for example, or if they will help me understanding why a certain yield is achieved so that I can uh, use those as targets for selection. So here we need to think about uh, the complexity of the data we are dealing with, because on one hand, we are having a lot, a lot of images that are collected over time uh, and we need to process them. So at the beginning, we have a lot, a lot of, uh, or the size of the input data is very, very large. So we had a, a lot of pixels and pictures over time, but each of those pixels is not very informative. So the first part is to apply some feature structure, and here I think deep learning techniques, for example, are very promising because they help us, for example, to segment specific organs or to count specific structures, like I think a lot of work is ongoing in Australia, counting spikes, etc. Um, and then there is a second step that I will illustrate more in this uh, talk, that is how we can separate these genetic factors from spatial trends. And the third part is how we integrate uh, traits over time, and then only how to look at those traits and use them to predict E by E. So first, when we are dealing, so after we extracted the features we want to uh, have per plot, we need to separate, well, this, uh, we have the raw phenotypic data that is collected over time as representing represented here by these, these three different pictures. And we want to uh, separate them into something that is spatially dependent and something that is spatially independent. Well, I think, well, in Australia, um, you have a long tradition on models that have been very, very successful in separating these two sources of variation. And more recently, well, there have been other approaches based on splines that uh, do a similar uh, task. So after you have separated these two sources of variation, so the spatial trend and the genetic uh, variation, we can take those blues and fit a model over time. So in this case, well, this is illustrating a more traditional approach with a parametric uh, model like a logistic function. But the important thing that I want to highlight here is that the models or the parameters of those models actually embody G by E. Why? For example, because here we have two genotypes. We have genotype one, that we have their dynamics over time of leaf length. 
uh, and we have two conditions. So it's grown under water deficit here and water uh, without water limitation. And we see that the shape of those curves do doesn't change so much. In other words, the parameters of those two genotypes in response to the environment are quite stable, which means not no reaction to water deficit, where the same genotype reacts a lot to temperature, as indicated by these three colors of um, in red. In contrast, genotype two shows a very opposite pattern in the sense that it changes a lot its dynamics when we modify water availability, and it doesn't change a lot when we modify temperature. So in this sense, if we extract those curve parameters of these two genotypes to the uh, six types of environments, we can explain G by E. So in here we see as a sort of uh, linear regression kind of framework, we see that the parameters that describe the change in the rate of uh, leaf elongation of genotype one is very sensitive to temperature, but of genotype two is not very sensitive. So in this way, we extract those parameters, we can represent, hopefully, the whole range of combinations of temperature and water stress. And if we have those surfaces, so if we go from those yellow, yellow dots to the green surface, we can predict the whole reaction norm of each genotype and if we know the reaction norm of each genotype, we can understand which, or we can predict which genotype should we recommend for each combination of variables. That's a little bit the conceptual idea. But one thing is proposing the idea in one cartoon, and the other thing is trying to do it in real data, which is usually a lot more difficult. <laughs> so this is the work what, what we are trying to do now in Chile. So, well, before we go to the Chilean example, I want to highlight, well, we have a lot of sources of variation that have uh, a range of precision and um, yeah, technical challenges that enable us to characterize different parts of the genotypic response. So what are we trying to do here in Chile? Well, in a collaboration with the Universidad de Talca, Universidad de la Frontera, and the INEA, uh, we have a project uh, that is, we are applying it to uh, durum wheat, bread wheat, and quinoa. Uh, so now we show some data from wet uh, bread wheat because this is very recent in data and we are still uh, in the process of um, consolidating all our methods and conclusions. But uh, in the case of bread wheat, for example, we had 192 bread wheat uh, genotypes that were very diverse in, in origin. So many of them came from Simit, from Uruguay, from Chile, and from other sources. So to make it as diverse as possible, but with a phenology as constrained as possible. Because we didn't want to arrive at the conclusion that, to, that uh, flowering time changes everything. So we want to try to find out other traits that are not necessarily related to the phenological phenology that help uh, genotypes adapt differentially to a uh, diverse drought stress. Why? Because here, well, we, this looks a very small map, but actually here we have a range of about 800 kilometers. Maybe for Australia, 800 kilometers is not so much, but... Uh, Given that this is a latitudinal gradient, it still represents very different climate. So actually, this is the central region is quite dry, and uh, wheat is planted a little bit in the winter. This is spring winter, spring wheat that planted in winter, a little bit like you do in Australia in some parts. And here, well, this is a little bit more dry, and in the south it rains a lot. So we have little water limitation. And we were having uh, phenotyping twice per week with RGB, thermal, and multispectral cameras. Uh, well, here you can see some cartoons about the trial in Valdivia. So like I illustrated conceptually, the first part, once we have the sources of variation, so we have here about 400 plots per trial, we need to separate what is genetic and what is non-genetic. And because we were phenotyping twice per week, well, it's a lot of 
uh, time points to analyze. So then I was very happy and my colleagues in Chile were very happy when they heard about this package that had been released in the Netherlands. And they said, whoa, this is very nice because we can sequentially analyze all those trials. So we just structure the data in a certain way. And then we do the um, spatial analysis correction. It doesn't matter so much how many time points we have, we can get some output. So let's see how it works. Here I have a small subset of our data. This is NDVI data of one of the trials. So here each of these little squares represents one plot, one experimental unit, and they are ordered by date. So these are all uh, uh, after flowering uh, measurements in which we have right after flowering and still later in the season. And we see that uh, well, the first thing we see that NDVI decays, how it should, we know it, it should happen actually, <laughs> because the plants are very green at the beginning and then they senesce until we have very little variation because everyone is already quite yellow and senescent. And uh, the, 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 the variance is also very small. So what happens? With the raw data, we see actually initially we have these very marked patterns because in the southern part of the experiment, these blue uh, experimental units represent parts of the experiments that were having much lower NDVI. That means actually these were more yellow plots. And in the top part, on the more northern part of the experiment, we see that in general plots were quite green still. So we have a strong spatial dependency that, well, we suspect it was spatial and not genetic because, of course, there was a randomization process via an alpha lattice, uh, no, a row column design. So, and once we move in the season, well, you see here the values go very uh, low. But how does it look? How can we separate these sources of variation that are on one hand spatial and on the other hand genetic? Well, then we apply this uh, StatGen HTP package, like I showed, that basically uses uh, P splines. But what are these P splines or penalized splines? Actually, to understand P splines, we need to understand B splines that are base functions that were proposed uh, some time ago uh, by Paul Ehrlers and Brian Marx and Maria Durban. And uh, B splines are basically small polynomials that are defined in a certain range. They can be linear, like this one we show here, that look like a little bit of a triangle, quadratic or cubic. But the important thing is that they are uh, defined in a certain range, and we have many of those copies along the whole range of the variable we want to um, model. And what happens actually in this case, we have, for example, some uh, cubic B splines. We have some coefficients that basically stretch or shrink, shrink these uh, B splines, making them explain our data. For example, this red dot that I have here comes from the sum of the value that is taken by this blue B spline plus this one the green one plus the black one. So if I add these three, they will add up to this point. But the issue is a little bit that if we let these coefficients very wild, we don't put any constraint, we will go to overfitting. So we will perfectly explain our data, but this is not what we want to do because we don't want to explain the errors also. We only want to explain the relevant part of the variation. And this is why, well, uh, Eilers and Marx proposed that actually this coefficient should be embedded in a linear mixed model for which we have a sort of penalization and for which we assume a certain distribution so that we prevent from overfitting. So this is what uh, has been implemented in this FAT package and later in the StatGen HTP package uh, organized by uh, the Biometrics group. So here, this is how the SPATS model looks for one time point. And you see that in a certain way, obviously we expect that the data was collected 
uh, on, for example, the 9th of November is similar to the data that was uh, collected the 16th of November, because of course these two time points are adjacent in time, and therefore it's not strange to expect that, for example, the plots that have a lower NDVI here uh, will also have a lower NDVI the next time point. So it, this is it, it makes sense that these two fitted spatial trends tend to also have a time correlation. And well, this is why also uh, I think the, um, they are trying to expand this method to a strategy in which you can model space, so rows, columns, and time simultaneously. But for the moment, I am showing the approach that uh, applies a per time point approach. So you separate rows, columns for time point one, then you separate row columns for time point two, etc. And we extract the blues or the black. Yeah. To later uh, model the trends over time. So here, this is work uh, done by a PhD, PhD student uh, in collaboration with the Universidad de Talca that is uh, further north in our country. He's uh, Francisco Mejias, very enthusiastic student, and he has been working, analyzing this data. And one of the things we want to look at to first, how reliable is our data, isn't it? Because one thing is to have these nice plots, uh, and the other thing is to make something that is useful for prediction. So here we see that in general, this is just for one trial. We see that in general, heritabilities were quite high, above 0.5, but the heritability severely decreases towards the end of the growing season. And this is not necessarily because the trials became more imprecise, but because the genotypic variation became smaller. Basically, everyone is tenest, so everyone is yellow, therefore, the, we don't have any more genetic variants. But one of the nice fe features from this package is that uh, you can um, separate the sources of variation and very easily uh, understand a little bit how the components that underlie this heritability are changing over time. Another thing that could be interesting when we are analyzing this uh, type of uh, traits like NDVI or the other traits that we monitor over time is uh, what is called the effective dimensions. The effective dimensions indicate how relevant a certain uh, spatial component is. So for example, if a higher that is, is interpreted a little bit like uh, a variance component or a sum of squares, so the higher the effective dimension, the more important that component is for the spatial trend. So in this case, we see that initially, for example, in November, we have a very big importance of rows. And then, well, at some point, this was reverted. Uh, and that the smooth part, in this case, of the column dimension was decreasing over time. So it was becoming sort of more even or, or less, um, the global trend variation was becoming le less evident, and the variation was more assigned to specific rows uh, that were reacting differently. Yeah. So this is one of the features that is also implemented that help us, for example, what we are trying to do now with another thesis tune, we are trying to work out, because we also measured with really some embaryotyping, we measured some a grid of soil characteristics like the volumetric water content, the, the, um, the and different uh, pore size, uh, and the amount of uh, large pores, um, how they are distributed in space. And the work we want to do now is to see to which extent the physical properties of our soil relate to the fitted spatial trend that we observe for yield. For example, here we have yield in Valdivia, and we see that the places which have different, it doesn't coincide perfectly, but there is some degree of agreement uh, between the water content and uh, the uh, yield. So that's trying to understand, to make sense of uh, our the properties of our experimental site. 
Later for yield, we also want to hear this. We are, we, we are repeating this for each uh, trial. And when we combine it, we want to understand G by E. So here, this is a GGE by plot in which we show that most of the G by E is clearly uh, driven by the presence of irrigation. So we have these two sites that were irrigated that induce the contrast uh, with the other sites. And Valdivia, that is the most high radiation, let's say, more a uh, cool environment and uh, with uh, less water stress is also a little bit uh, in between. And regarding the genotypes, well, this is a work we still have to do because uh, the whole um, uh, set of genotypes were genotypes with a SNP chip. But for the moment, we are only having some sort of uh, passport data. But we already see that, for example, Uruguayan genotypes, they tend to uh, adapt less good to Chilean environments, whereas the Chilean environment and the Simit environment themselves tend to be more favored in these uh, sets of environment, especially to this Santa Rosa, for example, that was a more dry trial. So here I will show some different strategies that are not probably related. Some of them were applied to this data set, but some were applied to other data sets. But I want to illustrate the approach that we can use to uh, combine traits like NDVI or other dynamic traits with um, yield to predict and improve the predictions of yield. So here I first will refer, so how can we integrate this additional phenotypic information? Well, we can incorporate it in different ways. One is the correlated response to selection. For example, we select in a platform and we expect a reaction in the field, or we select for NDVR and we expect that yield would increase. So this applying the selection response theory. Or we could use multi trait prediction, or structural equations and graphical models, or factorial regression. So here, I think I will start with one that hasn't been uh, applied yet. I'm sorry, I should. I, I wanted to show this to you, but I will show it. I promise for the for the G by E by M symposium. But the idea there would be to uh, use these dynamics of NDVI to predict yield, and to see how the correlations between NDVI and yield also change over time. Because, for example, here I'm showing some example uh, of previous work that I did with APSIM for wheat in Australia. There we saw that, for example, genotypes that have a high canopy, very green, very vigorous at the beginning, they use too much water. And actually, having a big canopy has a negative correlation with yield. However, in non-dry environments, the correlation between uh, canopy size and yield always stay positive. So this is something we want to test for the type of real data. So in, in a previous paper, I showed some simulated data with APSIM. Now we want to apply this uh, same idea and to test it with uh, real data in Chile. Yeah. So a second uh, thing we want to show is to understand or to use these graphical models to understand trait relationships. A little bit like I showed for the sunflower example in which we know, if we know uh, that certain traits are relevant to adapt to certain environments, we can use those trait relationships to understand the type of environmental drivers of G by E. For example, this is again simulated data we use for a paper and uh, published by some, some time ago by Willem Krauer. And there we saw, for example, that in dry environments, the water parameters were relevant to biomass. And then, then where in, when we didn't have water limitation, this uh, lower limit for water update didn't have any explanatory um, or any association to biome. So the topology of those networks can indicate which traits were uh, helping genotypes to adapt to certain environmental stress. So here I'm showing the same thing, but I didn't show it as a network, but actually these are uh, the con conditional independencies. So these are uh, partial correlations that could be also uh, okay. 
uh, made as a network. So they represent the conditional independence network estimated with the NatGiwas package by Paria Berusi that I applied to the uh, GBAE data collected in Chile. So we saw there, for example, we see the GTE by plot. We see actually that in Santa Rosa and Valdivia, for example, the trade relationships were quite different than in Santa Rosa in 2018 that was irrigated. Yeah, so in this way, we see that, for example, these trials are ordered. Each of these little squares represent one of the trials, and they are put in the same order as the arrows here in the GGE by plot. We see those trials are here above. They have a similar pattern in trade relationships, and those trials that drive are contrasting in GBAE, they tend to have another pattern in trade relationships. So um, this is what we want to expand. So here I'm showing this for yield and yield components. So for yield, kernels per spike, thousand kernel weight, spikes per square meter, and harvest index. But later we will expand, including the phenomic data, trying to understand, for example, whether the slope of the NDVI decay, for example, is related to yield or not. We expect that there will be a lot of uh, GBI ongoing uh, for that trade. And the relevance of NDVI, I think it will be a lot larger for um, in dry environments than in non-dry environments. So the last example I want to show is uh, about factorial regression. So here, I uh, apologize, I will switch again uh, to another data set, not necessarily to the uh, Chilean data set because I'm, it's work that is ongoing. But I want to illustrate a work that some work that we did recently with BAE, for example, that was submitted to TAG, in which we use these factorial regression models um, to illustrate how the coefficients of sensitivities of genotypes to the environment change. So actually what he applied here were four different models. We have on one hand the additive model, then we had a factorial regression model unpenalized, and some deep learning model, and some factorial regression that was penalizing the coefficients. In that some way, we were taking into account that all these genotypes were uh, having coefficients that were would be uh, related to each other. And we apply that to two data sets, on one hand to uh, the um, DROPS data set that is MACE. In this case, we saw that uh, in general, the penalization had a very big impact. If we see this unpenalized factorial regression worked very uh, badly, and uh, the other models were quite similar. So here we have a wheat data set. So this is the upstream wheat data set. We have four environment types, and we have a little bit the same result, which highlighting the importance or the contribution of uh, estimating these coefficients that describe the reaction of the different genotypes to the environment, but those, genotypes, those coefficients should be penalized, as illustrated here by um, the, um, the red line. And when we were comparing, for example, that with a deep learning approach, that is a kind of a competing uh, strategy at the moment, we saw that their uh, prediction qualities were quite similar, but that uh, the factorial regression was a lot more simple and uh, faster to run. So this is one more uh, practical advantage. So this was to finalize, to show the last strategies we can use to uh, predict or to incorporate additional information, uh, phenotypic information, uh, to predict yield adaptation across multiple environments. So to um, wrap up, well, to understand the TP is very critical for obtaining predictions that accelerate genetic gain. And here I showed the example of self-organizing maps, how the, this technique can help us using this additional phenotypic information to group locations into regions in which uh, certain patterns or certain uh, trade correlations between genotypes are, are observed for genotypes. Then we can also um, 
identify this um, or use these trade correlations as illustrated with the networks patterns, for example, trying to uh, use the network topology to classify or to understand which environments were uh, having similar, similar stresses. And here we can use, I showed one example that was illustrating new components, but if we extract the dynamics of the NDVI, for example, and we uh, incorporate the decay of those and DVI patterns and their differences between genotypes, those could be incorporated and helping us to classify uh, GBI responses. So, and here what? We can uh, predict target traits uh, incorporating underlying traits. And here, well, I showed some ways dynamic traits like the uh, NDVI, but they could also incorporate it in a more factorial regression approach, like I showed uh, for the wheat and uh, the, sorry, for the absent wheat and the um, maize example. So to finalize, I would like to thank, well, the funding agencies and uh, the colleagues from different uh, universities that were collaborating in this work. And I would also like to invite you uh, to our next interdraws that will take place in Chile, in La Serena. So it's not in the south because it's not rainy enough to uh, bring people that are interested in drought, but it will be in La Serena that is next to the ocean. And then the last day we will have a very nice trip to the Elki Valley where a lot of uh, pisco and uh, wine is being produced. So I invite you to uh, visit our webpage and to we will start posting and we have our first confirmed speaker. So we will start posting that information soon in our webpage. So thanks for the invitation and uh, I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much, Daniela, and um, for very nice um, and comprehensive uh, view over many scenarios um, where you've applied some of these technologies. Um, so we have time for some questions and um, would remind everybody if you want to ask a question, you can type that into the chat and Phoebe and myself will monitor it and, and put the questions to Daniela. The good news and the bad news is that there are no questions yet, which means that I get to ask the questions. I. I'm interested in um, Daniela, um, if that's okay. Um, sure. One of the things that I was really interested in um, with your self-organizing maps, where you sort of displayed the schematic of how the self-organizing maps are intended to operate, you sort of stretch out the space that sort of is represented um, perhaps somewhat where you try to capture in principal component analysis that was the comparison that you actually um, do this to. And quite often with principal component analysis, people focus on maybe the first three principal components, um, maybe not the, for any other good reason than the, those of the largest um, components. But what I was sort of interested in was in the the clusters, you, you identify features that are associated with these clusters as you stretch out the map. And have you had a chance to actually look to see if what you're doing is pulling out features that are specific to particular genotypes and environments that may be important and hidden in these higher dimensions in principal component analysis and increasing your chance of actually um, looking and seeing those features in the data set? Uh, is, is that a possibility with self-organizing maps? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question correctly, but uh, I... Yeah, I can try and repeat it if, it, if, if that would help. So, it, so in even in your biplot that you showed with the G plus G by E, you might have captured 60% of the G by E interaction. So there might be some really important interactions for a few really key genotypes, but they may actually occur in dimensions or principal components four or five. And so mm -hmm. if you don't look at the higher order principal components, you won't see those. 
I was just wondering if more of those features might actually be captured in the clusters on the grid that you showed with your self-organizing maps. Do, do you find that you do a better job of spreading the details that, that may be in higher principal components into features? Yeah, actually, I think, well, you can manage. Yeah, that, that's a good point because I think you can manage that by the size of uh, the grid you define. So actually, if you increase the size, you will have more units, but each of them represented by a smaller number of genotypes or trials, depending on how you structure it. So by, let's say, zooming in, you are able to more fine tune to have a more more fine representation of the trade relationships. That's that's a, you are completely right. And there you are also representing simultaneously well the different trades. So if you are interested in specific parts of the germplasm, you can also look at the layers or the, or the this prototype description per genotype to see how they are uh, described. So yeah, yep. you have a lot of flexibility to zoom in and, and then because a cluster analysis is applied, you can still zoom out, let's say, and have more coarse representation. Yep. But at the end, I think it's also very relevant to check with a linear mixed model, for example, uh, to which extent the groups that you are forming really uh, explain the by So because, yeah. Yep. So. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat. One of them is sort of for a statistics 101 class, but I'll let you um, give your perspective on this. So uh, Mustafa is asking, um, what's the difference between blues and blups? And when would you use blues and not blups? Yeah, so the main difference is whether they are put as fixed or as random in, in a linear mixed model. So when you use genotypes as fixed, then we call them blues. Yeah, and when they are put as random, then they are blobs. And the main difference is that when you put them random, well, you can calculate the variance component and therefore the heritability, but also the blobs are shrinked, shrink, shrunken. So that means that extreme values are pulled towards the mean. So if you plot the blues and plot the blobs and your heritability is one, then they will be almost exactly the same. But the lower the heritability, those extreme values are brought towards the mean. So they are it's more carefully uh, pulled towards the mean. And that, that has some consequences because if you use those blobs, for example, for a second analysis, a GBI analysis, you will shrink them twice and you don't want that. So usually when you do a two-stage analysis and you want to first calculate the blues for one trial and do a GBI analysis or a QTL analysis or a genomic prediction analysis, you put them as fixed in the first part and you store also the, 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 the standard error to use it as weights. But if you want to uh, use them immediately and you want to be a bit conservative about their, their behavior, you might look at the blobs uh, directly. Thank, yeah. thank you, Daniela. One, maybe one that's really Easy and quick to answer um, from Raju, apart from NDVI, what other dynamic traits have you been looking at? And this will be the last question for your time series yeah. analysis. So we are using, uh, well, thermal cameras. So therefore canopy temperature over time. And also from the RGB and the multi-spec that we are ha having other indices, the hue that is basically a color uh, intensity and other, yeah, uh, like other, other other future, but I have uh, features, but I have to say that they don't look as promising as the NDVI at mm. the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Daniela. Okay, thank you very much. We'll bring this session to a close now, but uh, like to thank you for a great talk and for uh, to everybody else from uh, for joining us today. Uh, there will be a recording of Daniela's presentation, and it will be available on the. Plant Success YouTube channel soon. If you want to use it and um, watch it again, use it and share it with um, some of your other colleagues. Um, and um, just also, again, think about the invitation from Daniela to enjoy the inter-drought meeting next year at La Serena in Chile. 
it's a wonderful location and it'll be a wonderful conference and also the G by E by M symposium that was mentioned at the beginning of the session. Thank you very much, Daniela, for a very stimulating talk and um, we'll let you relax for the rest of your evening. Thanks. Have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.